the, the Heat Smart communities. Um, you know, Arlington and Winchester are working together. Um, in this same round, we have three other communities or groups of communities. Uh, neighboring Belmont has their own campaign you know, with a municipal light plant. I think they felt like it made sense for them to, to have their own campaign. Uh, and then Hudson and Stowe, um, a little bit further out, and Marshfield um, down on the South Shore are all kind of working in parallel with this campaign. Uh, and then, so, so we're in the second round now. The pilot round communities uh, were spread out throughout the state um, from Great Barrington to Nantucket. Um, and then in Metro West, we have uh, Concord, Carlisle, and Lincoln, and um, uh, Harvard and Bolton. So we learned some great lessons from the pilot. Um, you know, if our goal here is to uh, increase community awareness and adoption of these clean heating and cooling technologies, um, here are some of our results from the pilot. Uh, you know, one piece of that is just how many people, you know, kind of signed up as leads. And so that was over 600 people. Um, which was fun to see in certain towns. It was, you know, 5% of the population and more, you know, signed up as a lead and, you know, at least talked about these technologies in their home. So that's exciting to me that we're really starting to, to reach kind of a significant, a critical mass in these towns that are participating. Uh, to date, we've installed over 110 projects, which produces over 7,000 metric tons of carbon equivalent over the lifetime. Um, uh, so kind of exciting results on the adoption side. Um, the other you know, kind of benefit of the program is what motivates the people that did sign up in the pilot to sign up. This is results from our, our survey of pilot participants. Um, kind of the, the highest answer there was people saying that they felt comfortable going with the, the vetted installer that was selected uh, by their community members. So, you know, one piece of our campaign is just providing education. I'm gonna talk about these technologies. You know, we kind of hope that a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, but during the, the length of the campaign, you will have kind of a fixed discounted price from a certain installer who um, has been selected by the community organizers with the help of Cadmus as a technical consultant. So that, I think, was a big motivator for some people in the pilot. Um, then the other outcome of the pilot, which you know, we hope to see, is just people's general awareness level of these technologies. So if everyone was coming in, this was, question was specifically asking about uh, ground source and air source heat pumps. People were kind of coming in around the middle, like two and a half, three, um, and by the end, people, you know, whether or not they had signed a contract, the survey participants felt like their knowledge of the technologies had increased. Um, so why? Why do we care? Why are all your neighbors working so hard to, to run this program? Um, you know, I, I think as you all may know, and I'm sure Susan uh, w works hard to, to address our state's ambitious greenhouse gas goal. So we want to get 80% reduction by 2050. That's state law. Um, you know, to really get s such deep cuts, we're going to need to take a significant chunk out of the building uh, space and water heating section, which is over a quarter of our state's greenhouse gas emissions currently. So a big chunk of that will be energy efficiency, um, but you know, we're, we're not gonna be able to get all the way there with energy efficiency by itself, so we have to talk about how we decarbonize our building heating and cooling. Um, and you know, we think that the technologies we're gonna to present tonight do really offer exciting solutions um, for the greenhouse gas side of things, uh, but also just superior quality and comfort and lower operating costs than some other fuels. So a little deeper dive into the greenhouse gas side. Um, you know, especially the heat pumps are operating on electricity right now, so uh, there's a question, you know, you know, if you're comparing it to the kind of the electric car of heating, uh, electric cars are uh, cleaner right now based on the current grid mix and will get, you know, potentially to 0% uh, carbon depending on the grid mix. And it's the same thing for the heat pumps. Um, Susan mentioned that statewide we're at 14% renewable energy. This graph is actually a little bit outdated. It shows 12% uh, 
uh, renewable energy. So if in your communities you're having even higher renewable energy, the heat pumps will look better already today and then just kind of get better from there as the grid cleans up. Uh, and then the other two technologies, the modern wood heating uh, is a little bit less dependent on the, the grid and then solar hot water too. Um, you can see a very small carbon impact just to, to run the pumps for that technology. Um, you know, but basically that's uh, you know, nearly 100% renewable. Oh, this is my little note I just said about how you know, the, the other work your, your towns have done through the community choice aggregation really kind of puts you ahead of this graph already. All right, so I, I, I guess I kind of jumped into it with the graph, but the four technologies that we're talking about tonight uh, that I think offer really exciting solutions either for full displacement of your buildings, heating and cooling, or you know, partial um, solutions you know, depending on what's kind of right for your home, our air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, also known as geothermal, modern wood heating, and solar hot water. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about each technology, and then you'll get to hear from people who actually have them. Uh, so first up, air source heat pumps. Uh, why is it, uh, what, how does it work? Um, basically, it uses uh, the compression cycle to move heat from indoors to outdoors, depending on the season. Uh, so it kind of works on the same principle as an air conditioner, but is just able to work in reverse. And because it's moving heat instead of generating it, it can be two to three times more efficient than electric resistance. Uh, what else do you want to cover there? Um, it's also, you know, especially for the ductless air source heat pumps, more efficient than uh, standard central AC, so you'll not only be gaining on the heating side, but also the cooling side. Um, and like I said, a lot of the solutions are ductless, so that's what's pictured here. Um, it was great if you don't have duct work in your home, you can just run that, you know, use that indoor unit in your, uh, in your home. Um, and then the outdoor unit uh, is the condenser shown, shown to that side. Um, so, energy saving, it's quiet, it's efficient, um, it gives you some flexibility um, in terms of you know, zoning different spaces or if you just need a heating or cooling solution for one part of your home, it can kind of uh, you know, either do the full home or do a piece of your home. Uh, it has smart controls. Um, and then just to kind of give people frame of reference, uh, a single zone, which you know, could typically heat one room or one large space in your home, starts around $4,000. It's kind of a, a base price. Um, so moving on to ground source heat pumps. Uh, works on a similar principle, but instead of having that outdoor condenser draw the energy from the air, uh, there's wells that are drilled you know, often hundreds of feet into the ground or else, um, you know, over hundreds of feet um, horizontally that are taking the constant temperature of the earth and using that uh, to, for the preheating and cooling um, of the home. And um, these are really a whole home solution. Uh, and they're the most efficient uh, heating and cooling solution out there. Um, I should say space heating. Uh, we'll talk about some water options in a minute. Um, and because they're, they're tapping into that constant ground temperature, you know, we can say they're over 400% efficient compared to electric resistance. Uh, so because they're so efficient, they have the lowest operating cost. Um, it you know, really is a, a whole home solution which can plug into certain homes if you kind of have the existing distribution system that works well with it. Um, uh, it's a long system lifetime. You know, the actual heat pump that's shown here uh, would go in the basement. That might have a 25-year life, but the well that you'd be drilling in the ground has a 50 to 100-year life. So you're really building a long-term asset on your property. Um, and there's no above-ground component. Uh, you know, obviously there's uh, disruption in the drilling, which maybe we'll hear about. Um, you know, there are ways to minimize that, but when things are, are done, um, you know, there's no above ground outdoor component. Um, the costs are kind of starting around twenty to twenty-five thousand um, dollars after incentives. Um, so it is a, a good investment. Um, modern wood heating. So um, 
you may have also heard this referred to as biomass heating, but, but we kind of use this term modern wood heating to differentiate it from what people might be imagining in terms of a pellet stove. The, the products that we'll be offering through this campaign really are very automated um, and very efficient and clean. So, so it's pretty different uh, from a pellet stove, uh, especially in that they're connected to a distribution system and they can often plug right into your home's existing hydronic distribution system. Um, which is a good benefit of them. Um, you know, self-load, you're not gonna have to be like putting wood in it. It's, you know, automatically fed by pellets that are delivered by a truck, kind of automatically uh, brought into your home via vacuum tube, kind of the same way you'd have your oil truck pull up, you know, maybe two or three times a year, you'd have a pellet truck do a delivery. Um, and, you know, very automated, maybe just a couple times a year, you'd have to empty a little ash bin. Uh, into your garden or something like that. Uh, so energy savings, the benefits, it's energy savings. Um, there, uh, I think it's a big appeal to a lot of people that you're connecting to your local forestry economy and you know these pellets are all coming, uh, not necessarily from Massachusetts, but, but from uh, New England area. So you're, you're connecting into the local forestry economy and supporting uh, that local economy. Um, this technology can also provide hot water. Um, and cost starts around $12,000 after incentives. And then the fourth technology I'm going to talk about tonight is solar hot water. Um, so I know for those of you who participated in the uh, Solarize campaign, you, you may have, um, you know, be pretty familiar with solar PV, and many of you um, may also be familiar with solar hot water. But you know, it does, as the name suggests, it provides uh, hot water. Um, to your home, usually with two or three collectors on your roof. Um, so the sun's directly heating a liquid that then heats your domestic hot water. Um, typically provides around 80% of a home's hot water with a little bit of backup for some of the colder times. Um, and, you know, because you're not converting the solar radiation into electricity, you know, per square foot, it's even more efficient. Um, you know, per that square foot of roof space. It's a very efficient use of the solar radiation to directly heat the water. Um, so, you know, this technology is energy savings, very low operating costs. Um, you know, you're, you're just kind of running the pumps, but other than that, you're, you're, you're um, capturing the free radiation from the sun, um, you know, and providing, you know, basically for that, up to 80% of your heat uh, at kind of no cost heating solution. Um, and prices after incentives are starting around $2,000 currently. It's a, I guess, it's a, it's a reliable technology. The picture at the bottom shows it, you know, being installed in the Jimmy Carter White House. So it's been around for a while and, you know, tested and proven out. So this slide is a little bit text heavy. Um, I would urge you not to worry too much about um, memorizing all the details. Uh, the HeatSmart website is going to have all this information. We'll have handouts, and then when installers are selected, they'll kind of walk you through exactly what is applicable in your own situation. So I'll do a, a kind of a high-level overview. Um, there are incentives uh, available from, for all of these technologies, and your installer will, will really be the best one to kind of walk you through what the full package looks like and what that will mean for you. Because uh, the incentives are a mix of kind of upfront, um, incentives and then long term. Um, there's also tax credits. Um, so, you know, if we took ground source heat pumps, there's a 30% federal tax credit. There's also a mass CEC rebate that's upfront, taking off around 15 to 20% of the cost. And then there's a operating credit for the thermal energy you produce um, that is, is around four to six thousand dollars. So like I said, your installer will kind of work with you to, to you know, explain what this package would mean for you in terms of what you'd actually be paying out of pocket. Um, and then one incentive that is applicable to all technologies is the mass save heat loan. So this is a great uh, financing vehicle. It's 0% interest for seven years, up to $25,000. Um, and it's offered, you know, not through mass save, but through uh, dozens of local banks. So great option for financing these projects. Uh, and then one other note is that we do um, for all the technologies besides air source that are eligible for mass CEC rebates, we offer higher incentives for income qualified households. Um, and we just put up you know, some of those thresholds to show you know, that they're 
um, you know, Massachusetts has high median income, I guess. Um, uh, so the last thing I'm going to end on here before turning it over to hear from um, the customers who actually have this is just what you can do now. And I think echoing Fritzi already said some of what's back there uh, on the tables as you came in. Um, sign up for a home energy audit. Um, they are, you know, we require the home energy audit if you're getting a mass CEC rebate and the mass safe heat loan you need to have had a home energy audit. Um, so it's, it's important for that reason and then it's also just important um, if you're considering a new heating and cooling system, doing the energy audit first can really help you size your new system, you know, downsize it and save money on the capital costs of the new system because of the upgrade, the, you know, investment you've made in your home and air sealing and weatherization and there really are very generous incentives with mass save paying for 75 plus percent of, of those measures. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, you could do if you're, you know, from what you hear tonight, if you're already ready, like, okay, I know, you know, these technologies are, I want a, a site visit. We have places you can sign up and say, yes, you know, when this installer is selected, um, pass on my contact information and, and let them contact me for a site visit. Uh, so now I think we're going to hear from some customers who actually have these technologies, and I'll let Fritzi introduce them. So if the panelists would like to come on up and have a seat um, here, that would be great. That's okay. Thank you, Meg, for going through um, sort of a general understanding of the Mass Heat Save Heat Smart program. Air system pumps have a reputation of being mostly for cooling, and they've changed a lot. It's kind of like LEDs, where they used to be really expensive, and they used to be, you know, why would you do this? And now LEDs are everywhere. You can buy air source heat pumps primarily for cooling, and they do a bit of heating. But you can get what are called cold climate heat pumps that you can that can be all of your heating. They, they go down to negative 13 degrees. So I wish I had those, but I don't. So what I'll tell you about is my experience with air source heat pumps that are now a little on the old side. So mine are good to the mid 20s. Um, so I do use them for heating. I use them on top of my efficient gas system, but I got them primarily for cooling. We got rid of all our old window bangers. We're paying less. And on top of that, what I haven't appreciated is they're much quieter, they're much more comfortable. Um, they are just, it's a horse of a different color. So we love them for cooling. And then for heating, we use them in the shoulder season so that we can run our gas a whole lot less. So it reduces our carbon footprint. And again, they're really comfortable. Um, so it was almost, we have one big zone for our house for the gas system. So with the air source heat pumps, it makes it into like five zones, really. So we can set the gas low, and then if we're not in a part of the house, no problem. We're just not running them. Um, but then, you know, so essentially we kind of picked up zones for heating that we didn't have. Um, so I think those are, those are the, the comfort and the, um, the use and the impact. But the other thing that I would mention, the slides, so we do have those cassettes that go up the top. This is a dominant source of heating and cooling around the world. Like Western Europe, like 70 or 80% of Western Europe residents use this. So there's a lot of different varieties. You can get ones that go on the ground in your house, you know, like a radiator. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of other options that aren't immediately evident because only 6% of North Americans use um, but there's a lot of other options. So as we bring our new vendors in and you get to talk to them, talk to them about your house and how you would like to install them in your house. The other thing is, you don't have to, if you look at the, can you switch the slide to the outside? Um, you don't have to look at this. If you go by my house, you can't see that thing. That thing's under the porch. So you can hide the condenser. The outdoor unit can be completely invisible. The other thing is, the, um, the lines that run on the outside of the house, it's kind of like a tiny little downspout. You can hide it next to your, your downspouts, and you can also paint it the same color as your house. So even though I have those things on the outside of my house, they're painted. So it, it can be a very subtle. It doesn't have to be, you know, like, oh, look, I have this thing on the outside of my house. Um, so I kind of like that it's underneath the screen and porch, and I don't have to look at it. Um, I think that's everything. We really like them. I would highly recommend them. Oh, modern wood heat. 
Hi, my name is Wyatt Beal, and I'm a beneficiary of Solarize program and the Modern Wind Heat program. Um, I chose uh, this technology because I gen generally like the idea of heating my house with wood. Uh, it's sustainable, it's locally sourced. Uh, as Christine mentioned, a lot of the money stays within the local economy. Um, but also this is a uh, very reliable, uh, robust technology that I felt uh, was going to work well in our home, which has forced hot water radiant heat, um, as many Massachusetts homes do. Um, if you have uh, forced hot air, um, these systems can also be converted into furnaces, so it's not that big of a change. I believe it's a little bit of an extra cost. But um, typically these systems are used as boilers um, that can convert into forced hot air. Um, the way it works is pretty simple. Um, the unit is about as big as your standard boiler. Um, there is the pellet bag, which in order to receive the rebates, which uh, are $12,000, you need to install a three-ton bag. And to give you a size, uh, to give you an idea of what that size is, it's basically about two uh, oil tanks put together. So you do have to make sure that you have enough size in your basement uh, to accommodate the three bag. But it's completely maintenance free. Uh, the pellets are fed into the boiler um, whenever they need it or once a day and it cleans itself and all the leftover ash or what they are called fines are cleaned from the boiler and then compacted into uh, a small cassette which you empty. Uh, maybe I go empty it once a year uh, based on my fuel usage. And we have a 2,000 square foot home. It's extremely well insulated. Um, and we only go through about $1,000 worth of uh, fuel per year, um, give or take uh, a couple hundred bucks, depending on the, on the coal. Um, the other benefit of this, and I believe it may apply to other technologies, is that the state does pay a portion of your fuel bill. So although the fuel costs aren't extraordinarily high, um, we do get rebates to about I think 8% every year uh, of the cost of that fuel. So there's no special um, adjustments that you need to make with uh, the, the exhaust. It goes straight up the chimney. And um, so far, so good. I really liked it. And uh, I'll stay after the presentation to answer any questions for those who are interested. Take one small comment. Hi, Susan's comment about the prevalence of air source heat pumps um, in Europe and in you know, Japan and Korea, it's like 90% of heating. It's sparked and reminded me um, the same thing for modern wood heating. Um, not quite at the same scale, but these are technologies you know, that, that were kind of the automated boilers were really developed and refined in Europe, especially in Austria and Germany. There's one state in Austria where a third of homes use these kind of modern wood heating boilers. So even though it's a little bit newer to the US market, there is a pretty well developed track record of it over in Europe. Thank you, so, so. Hi, my name is Dave Fonseca, and uh, I am uh, one of the owners in Winchester who's installed uh, I'm actually a much more extensive solar hot water system than um, is the package that they're looking at, um, uh, you know, trying to get you to install in your own house. My system not only heats the hot water, but also does some of the heating for the house itself. And um, I've had the system since 2014. I've been very happy with it. Um, I uh, one of the pleasures of the system, and you don't have to be as engaged with it as I am. But um, I usually around this time of year, I usually turn my furnace off, and it's usually a week, sometime between now and June, where I'll have to turn on the furnace one more time, you know, if there's been a week without sun. But basically, from, you know, May through the end of September, uh, I don't need to have my gas furnace running at all. And uh, I think you'll find the same for, for your house if you install it. In fact, um, 
the contractor, who I had a renovation done, and that was the uh, point where it made sense for me to do this. Uh, the contractor who installed, had a sub installed. Um, his own family has one of these uh, solar hot water systems, and the furnace uh, stopped running in the basement, and he didn't notice. And his son came up, came and bugged him, and it turned out the furnace had been not working for two whole weeks. And this is a family that had five children. Uh, some of them were teenagers taking showers every day. They, they weren't the energy efficient types that I am. Uh, they're running the dishwasher every day. I'm sure they were doing clothes every day. They were using a lot of hot water, and yet they hadn't noticed that they were using 100% solar water. So uh, it's reassuring for me when I hear the, the whooshing sound when I go into my first floor bathroom, I can hear the water traveling up the wall, going up to the roof, and um, it's not really loud or objectionable. Um, but it just sort of makes me feel good when I, I hear that sound. I know I'm getting free energy. Hi, I'm Sue Cabra, and I'm geothermal, heating and cooling, and ground source. And we had the benefit that we were gutting a house. So back in 2012, we bought a property, gutted it, and over a few years, it was very important to us to do everything as green as we could. So in terms of insulation, rainwater collection, and geothermal was to me, out of all those decisions, the absolute easiest to make. And I am so happy that we made that decision. So it was actually financially cheaper to install geothermal because of the tax credits. So a high-end heating and cooling, you know, efficient gas system and the geothermal were almost identical in terms of installation. And then with the 30% tax credit, it was actually substantial savings to actually install geothermal. But I am just, you know, I love it. It's quiet. It's, we're never hot. We're never cold. It's just fantastic. We have two um, six-inch diameter, 300-foot deep um, tubes. And just to tell you, I live right up by the fells, so we are literally on granite. And it was actually, according to our installer, easier to install in towns like Arlington and Winchester where there's a granite ledge because when they're drilling, it doesn't collapse into itself. So um, don't let that deter you if you <laughs> think they can't drill down. But um, it's just been a fantastic experience. And in terms of service, I mean, other than changing filters a couple times a year, there's really nothing to do. We had for the first time since we installed it, um, the installer come back and just check everything, and it was really nothing to do. So. Uh, I forgot to mention that um, it looks like the, the ballpark figure that they've come up with for installing solar hot water is going to be about $2,000. And uh, unlike my system, which probably you would want to be going through a renovation, the solar hot water is a no-brainer if your hot water heater is on its last and you're going to be replacing <coughs> it. It's got a very, very quick payback and um, very shortly you will be sort of making money on this. So look at it if your, your hot water heater is getting old. <laughs> Thank you to the panelists. So now we'd like to just open it up for questions um, that are you know, fairly general. Uh, we can address anyone in particular. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. I'll repeat the question so we can hear across the room and then I'll give you the microphone. So the question is, on the air source heat pump, do you need to have an outdoor condenser for each indoor head? Okay. Good question. 
So for our house, um, we put one outdoor unit on either end of the house, and then on the ground floor, we have two, we'll call them cassettes, that are larger size. So they kind of push the air towards the center of the house, so the whole first floor feels heated or air-conditioned. And then the same outdoor unit um, also feeds the second floor. So on one end is the master bedroom, and the other end are the kids' bedrooms. So there's two off of one on one end, and three off of one on the other end. It's just smaller size cassettes. And I understand, as I mentioned, the technology's been changing. I understand now you can get up to eight different heads off of one outdoor unit, um, which wasn't the case when I was doing it. So I think uh, Meg mentioned right sizing. So if you get your house really insulated and sealed well, then you can get smaller and smaller cassettes and compressors and use less energy for the same amount of comfort. Um, and so certainly we had, you know, we had insulated and so forth beforehand. Um, but yeah, and they even have little blowers now. So if you have like a small um, little office space or something where you might not want a whole separate cassette, you could have one room with, um, with a blower in it and then just a little, um, like for a one bedroom apartment, you might get one cassette and then a blower that would go from the big room into the bedroom and a thermostat in that second room that would just turn it on when necessary. So it's really, it's evolved rapidly. Uh, the, the only thing I would add is, um, I think the most prevalent systems we saw in the pilot and that we see in Massachusetts are these ductless heat pumps, but there are also ducted options if anyone has duct work. Um, you can kind of drop in a heat pump the same way to connect your central AC to your ductwork. Um, you could drop in a, a centrally ducted heat pump also, as well as you know these one-to-one -one systems or the you know multi-head that Susan was describing. Anyone else have a question? Yes. I have some information too to the heat pumps. Um, with the, the ones that you've already got the ducts for AC, um, how is the noise? Because I had a similar setup like you and when I lived in this um, apartment in the city. So one was in the bedroom and one was on the office side in the living room and they did heating and cooling for the apartment. But I actually found it a bit noisy. It took me a while to get used to it and the clicking on and off. So I'm wondering, does the one that's like if it's been integrated with your already with your AC duct work, is it less noisy, do you think, or? So the question is about the centrally ducted air source heat pump, the noise level that might happen with that. Um, I guess some of the maybe older, I don't know how old this was, um, wall units uh, may have been a little bit noisier with the on and off. So I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Um, I, I will say in my experience with the newer units, they are pretty quiet, so you can add to that your own experience. Um, but even for the, the single heads, I think your question was saying you've, you've experienced some noisier sing the wall mounted cassettes. In my experience, they can be pretty quiet, or you know, there's some blowing air, and then I think if they're ductwork, it would be similar to kind of a, a forced air system. And I should add, not every ductwork can you necessarily just drop in a heat pump, but you know, your, your ductwork would have to be sized correctly. But you know, if it was sized correctly, I think it would. Kind of sound like a forced air system. Yeah. I know I'm not supposed to be repping um, heat pumps, but I also have a heat pump in my house, and we had switched from forced hot air to using this on my third floor, and it is so quiet. It is just it's almost silent. It is just something else. Yes, I think that's the um, general experience now, is that the air is not really coming out at a higher volume, so it's just sort of a constant flow, so it's not really a blowing. I, I think they're probably getting a little better. Yeah. Another question. So what's the plausibility of heating solely with Right, so um, I'm sure we can have several people address that. Um, how cold 
can you go and still heat with your air source heat pump or the ground source heat pump? So who wants to start? I'm going to start because I just had my sister visiting me who likes to heat at like 75. <laughs> and of course she came to visit when it was you know, like 15 degrees. It was no problem heating the house with GSR, but we have absolutely no backup and we have never had a problem not having a backup. So I mean we're 100% geothermal with no alternative. And then on the air source side, the most common application in Massachusetts currently is supplemental, um, you know, maybe similar to what Susan is describing, although, as she was saying, technology that's out of the market now, it can work down to, you know, negative five, negative 13, negative 20 degrees. So, so I would say, I think it's a question of, you know, how much capacity of heat pumps you want to buy. They certainly can be sized to heat your whole home, for new construction, for, for homes that are tightly insulated, you wouldn't even need you know, that much capacity to be your whole home as a sole source of heat. Um, I think for older homes that are leaky, that might end up being a lot of indoor heads. Um, many people will still keep their backup system. And there's a new mass save incentive out this year uh, to support integrated controls. So let's say you have an oil boiler and you put in some of these air source heat pumps. There's a the new incentive for mass save supports uh, extra costs to, to make sure that those two systems are talking to each other well. Yeah, I should say my, my heat pump, um, which we've had since 2014, is the sole source of uh, heat for the third floor and we've never had trouble. Um, I think it does switch over to resistance heating at a certain point automatically, which I think is the, the, what Susan's calling the newer kind. So, but it, I don't have to do anything; it just does it automatically. So, uh, but I don't think it's gotten down to below zero since 2014. So. <laughs> and I would just add a couple things. Um, I know with the integrated systems, we're learning about uh, this piece of the program. Um, so sometimes people are wondering, how do I know if my home would be a good candidate for some of these things? You would particularly save if your home is heated with oil, propane, or electric resistance heat. Um, there still can be savings with natural gas. And I think the other thing to consider is how much more life do you have in your system? So if you're gonna be replacing something fairly soon anyway, you might want to get ahead of the game um, before it dies and it's an emergency. Um, so those are some things to consider. Um, and with the integrated system, you know, you can kind of maintain your current system as a backup, but use it much, much less. And then when it dies, we may be, you know, able to just supplement it with enough extra air source heat pump to really fully um, heat and cool. Another question? So the question is, once they're finished drilling for a ground source heat pump, what can you see? All my beautiful native plants. <laughs> you really, they're, you, I, at this point, couldn't even tell you where they are anymore. I mean, I know. So these but, are like a tube of heat or anything? Or? Yeah, they're literally, they're six inches in diameter, and it's just a tube that goes down 300 feet. And, I mean, they did have to dig it up at one point in the very beginning when they installed it, there was a little air, but that was in a tube that was running from there to the house. So it's easily accessible, which is good. Luckily it happened before we put the um, bluestone walkway. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you couldn't, I mean, you couldn't tell, I mean, there's enough dirt over it. I mean, we have a sprinkler system which ties into underground holding tanks, um, so I mean, it doesn't interfere with anything. And so when they drill a new one, do they, like you say, in 50 years' time? I think she said the lifespan was 20, 20 or 50 to 100 years, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they have to change a, the different place in the yard or and hook it up? Or? 
So I think a lot of these systems, they haven't actually come to the end of their life. So they say 50 to 100 years to be a little bit conservative, but I don't know if we've actually uh, reached the end of the life for these, you know, they could actually be longer. Um, so just to reiterate, the indoor um, pump, which we saw a little bit, I think, here, which is the indoor unit, that is a lifespan of around 25 years. And then the um, underground system is longer. One of the things that the installers do is when they come for your site visit, or even on the phone before they come, they will ask you many questions about your home, your property, so that they can get a sense of if it's even possible. They do need a certain amount of space. Um, you know, so there are certain you know, checklists that will help them help you know if it's even a possibility and then what are some of the things to decide upon. Um, and one of the things that the installers also often will do is when they're doing a proposal, they will list out the costs and it's always um, helpful when they list out costs that may be incurred but it's not part of their package like the landscaping. So you would at least know up ahead kind of what to expect. Um, in terms of the kind of disruption and what you might need to, to finish the project. Okay, and, uh, another question. So the question is, if you're really relying solely on the solar panels to heat your water in your home, how hot can it really get and how long can it last? How much storage do you have? Um, this is actually, I can explain what happens and maybe it will help you. Um, uh, in my system, what happens is I have a big heat storage tank and the water that comes in to my hot water heater actually goes through it first. So by the time it gets into my hot water tank, it's already hot. So the, the hot water tank doesn't need to run its own heater. Um, now in the systems that um, these companies will be installing um, as part of the package here, they've integrated in these two ideas together. And I've forgotten how. Yeah, I, I, I forgot, yeah, the, the, the two companies we evaluate, I think that's slightly different methods. But anyway, what ends up happening is um, the trigger point for uh, the heating method that creates carbon is going to be slightly lower than the trigger point for the solar hot water. So basically, the solar pumps will run whenever there's sun up there available, and they will slowly raise the temperature of the tank. It's only when the tank gets below sort of the solar minimum, and then gets below the, the trigger point for, you know, at 120, say, for your own domestic hot water, that then resistance heating will get kicked on, or depending on whether it's hooked into your furnace or whatever, whatever is the traditional fallback for heating the water, that will get kicked on. Um, I'm just gonna thought here. Oh. Well, uh, just while you're collecting that thought, I know she asked about the, the temperature from the collectors. And yes, yes, yes. So essentially, even though the tank, uh, say after, like last week there was a lot of sun, as I recall. Uh, my tank was probably at 140, I think. I forgot the temperatures exactly. That's not safe for your house. You want a temperature coming out of, even when you turn on the tap, you, just so you don't get burned. It's maybe 110, 120. So there's a mixer that mixes down the temperature to the end hot water that's delivered to your house. So that's how 
the temperature in the tank can go up and down without causing the temperature at your hot water faucet to go up and down like that. And just to say, definitely depending on you know, these systems make water at, you know, at least 120 or 140. Um, and I think all the installers will work with you however they exactly configure their tanks. You'll have a tank that they've kind of sized to, to get you through that overnight period where the sun's not shining. My understanding um, so far is that they have 80 gallon size storage tanks and 120 gallons. So um, from what I understand, that's plenty big for the average family. Yes, question back there. Um, what's the lifetime on the solar panels for hot water? And does it change depending on whether you're at well water or out water? So the question is twofold. One is what is the lifespan of the solar hot water panels? And is it um, a different system or is there anything different if you're on well water versus town water? Does so anybody want to take that one? Um, so, the different components um, have different lifespans and different expectancies. As I recall, the panels are expected to last 25 years. Um, I can't see why they won't last longer. Um, they do not, the, the um, fluid used to transfer the heat from the panels down to your basement is not your um, domestic hot water, it's not your well water. Um, so that sort of stays constant. And so that wouldn't, you know, degrade the panels over time. And um, uh, I believe the tanks that the installers will be installing here are stainless steel and the installers sort of act like they will never go bad. We'll see. But it's certainly going to be way more than 10 years, the usual um, time period that um, we're used to seeing our hot water tanks have to be replaced at. I also just want to take a moment to say, um, in terms of solar hot water, sort of the most common use is for your domestic hot water, the tank there that you can use for your showers and your washing dishes, etc. There are other solar hot water uses. Um, I think as Dave mentioned, his home is heated through some radiant heating. So that's a, another use for solar hot uh, water. And the other thing that um, is an option is for folks who have a swimming pool, there are solar hot water heaters that are great for that. So that's another option. I saw one more question over here. Um, yes, back here. Uh, two part question, yeah. Um, the first is we've got a bunch of different technologies is it going to be a single installer that is able to represent all of these technologies? And then number two, um, is the installer going to be able to work with, say, replacing your entire heating system? If one of these options doesn't work, can they mix and match what would work with a new boiler or whatever it might be? Great question. Thank you. So the question is, we have four different technologies that we're offering through the HeatSmart program. And uh, the first question was, is there one person who could sort of oversee the choice and the evaluation for all of those? Uh, there is not one overarching um, evaluator. However, the installers know that this is an integrated program and that we're collaborating and working together. So they're aware that um, as they do a site evaluation, perhaps their technology wouldn't be ideal or won't work for you, but they will recommend something else. Not all of them are experts in the other one's technology, so they may say, I don't know for sure, but you could look into it. And one of the ways this program is working as a campaign that's unique here is that we're going to be gathering um, names of people who are interested and keeping track of them together so that if we see that you've expressed interest in three of the technologies, we'll be following up with the installers to make sure that they've each contacted you and make sure that things are following through. Um, and as far as sort of integrating several technologies, the Concord Carlisle Lincoln program uh, was a pilot last year and they did have some of that kind of collaboration and several of the installers really enjoyed that and have continued those collaborations since then. So we're hoping to have that kind of arrangement with the people that we choose as well. Okay. Yes. 
is it purely just for heating or can you use it for heating and cooling? Wood pellet, is it purely heating or can you do heating and cooling with the wood pellet? Yeah, so unfortunately you can't cool your house with wood pellets. Um, you can only heat your house with wood pellets, uh, but it can also serve domestic hot water. Okay, so let's uh, hear one more question. Well, I'm just curious about the wood pellets. Are they treated with something? How are, how are they generated? What does a wood pellet producer do to make them? So the question is, what are wood pellets? How are they made? Where do they come from? So uh, wood pellets are 100% wood. Uh, there's no additives at all whatsoever. And usually it's free of any kind of bark such that you re receive a very high quality pellet that leaves very little what we call fines or whatever, essentially unburned uh, wood or minerals. Um, and one of the components within wood is called lignin and it's an oil. And under very high pressure, uh, it binds the wood together and essentially it looks like rabbit food. On it, quite honestly, and um, but it's 100% natural. There's no um, additives. Um, depending on where it's sourced, um, you know, all of these products can come from uh, paper mills that are not using certain pieces of wood. They can come from lumber mills. They can come from uh, forests that have been um, cut down and sustainably uh, regrown. They can come from uh, waste wood from the forest floor. So there are a lot of different areas where these pellets can be sourced, but uh, it only contains wood and nothing else. Uh, that was a great answer. The only thing I would add um, about the sustainable sourcing, I guess you should have mentioned, um, to get the credits that Wyatt was talking about for kind of the ongoing supporting of the fuel costs, the pellet mills are working with the state of Massachusetts to certify where they're getting their wood, um, and you know, there are certain requirements about the sustainability of those sourcing, so that is something that they're keeping track of uh, to meet certain requirements for, for the wood pellets to get those credits. And I would also add that the installers that we're interviewing do um, only source these um, sustainably sourced pellets. So um, we're really considering that. I know some people have concern. Wait a minute, this is supposed to be sustainable. What do you mean we're using wood? It's all waste wood at this point. So, um, you know, it's, it's not that we're going out and cutting down trees just to burn in you know, a wood pellet stone. So, when, any last questions? Yes, one more. Yes, I don't know if we have any realtors in the house, but the question is, does anybody know what um, the impact of having geothermal system is on your property value? Anybody have any possible response? Again, I don't know if it's sort of a new-ish technology, um, but that might be, yes. I would also just add, um, so uh, the experience of the person who just spoke was that uh, in her previous house in New York, uh, it was a 
a great benefit to their sales process to be able to say to people that their heating cost was so low, it was about what, $1,200 a year? Heating and cooling. Because they had... That's everything electric. That was for all of my utility costs. Very different. So you had a lot of solar, solar PVs. So it's interesting, um, in our work uh, around town, Susan McPhee and I had gone to realtors uh, and we're talking about Heat Smart and also the wind power program. And they did mention that sometimes the solar arrays um, are an issue, but I think one of the things that people should be encouraged to ask is what are the energy bills for this home? How much have people spent? And I think once, as people learn to ask that when they're shopping for a house, they'll come to appreciate the work that's being done now because it will greatly help um, reduce costs. So if it's not something that we know about now, hopefully this kind of a campaign where people are learning about these technologies, feeling um, more comfortable with them, that when they are shopping for a home, they hopefully will begin to ask, what is the heating and cooling system and how much does it cost? Um, so we're, that's something that we're hoping is part of a result of this. So I